I'm in a negative after the release of the Winnow Crane. Based on the comments on my last video, I'll try to fix this issue by creating a facelift model with the new engines I've made that's used on the SR lineup. Hey guys, it's Trice here, and let's manage my car company. So obviously that we could tell is that my Type A engine for the Winnow Crane is not being used for the S and SL lineups, which is the cause of me losing $7 million a year. So to save this issue, let's go on over to the crane and click on the create a new facelift project, little gear, and create a new facelift. I'm not going to change like the overall body styling of the vehicle, it's just going to be using the LJ series engine and implement them to the SL and S trim levels of this car. So starting off with the S lineup, let's go in here and change the engine. So go into the engine selector, and let's go to clone variant, and clone the LJ series engine, the LJ16PC, the performance level version of this engine, and just make this the LJ16-C, get rid of the P there, to make this a standard level model of this engine. And most importantly, we gotta detune this from a performance level engine to a more standard level engine, so change performance bid to a standard bid type of intake manifold, the exhaust headers, change it from tubular to a cast bid, and so on. And from job to cam profile from a 47 to a 38, now we're making 70 horsepower, and a little bit of torque on the bid to low end, which is good. But overall, there's like nothing else that could be changed like drastically with this engine, so I'm pretty much gonna be happy with this current setup of 70 horsepower at 5200 RPM and a torque rating of 80.9 pounds feet of torque at 3800 RPM. So I guess this will be final for the common, less performancey engine of the LJ series lineup, so... Like I said, I'm not gonna change the design whatsoever for the exterior as well as the interior. Just leave this all as is for the S, SL, and SR lineups of this car. And seeing that this is a large factory for the engine factory, I might as well have to do the same thing for my car factory so I'm not... Well, mainly to put this factory to, like, use, quote-unquote, like, put to use, seeing that they're gonna be building so many engines when the factory's not being used that much. So it's going to take six months, so from October of 1966 to April 1967, this engine should be done, the LJ16C. Well, maybe the PC, mainly the C, but we already made the PC engine. And we can add the factory right away, so the factory might as well, for now, upgrade this to a medium 2. What's the difference? This is 17 months, and this is 12 months. Hmm... I guess medium three would do. Take the gamble. Because I want more cars to be out for my customers and put the engine factory to better use. So, no, 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 July 1967, this should all be done. Same thing with the upgrade to the car factory. Nine months? I don't know, it was like 17 months. Well, let's hopefully, hope to God, this works out. If not, then, I don't know. Let's not do it alone, let's just go forward. YOLO. Well, kids, watch us go into deep negative as the factory shuts down because of the upgrade. So, seven mil- Jesus Christ! We're in a recession, boys! George Bush, help me! So, the Crane and LJ engines are ready. Fourteen million dollars! Oh my god! This was well worth it, I guess. Nine million. Okay, now we're dropping. Ten million. Let's just let this run out for a little bit, and we'll design another car to basically boost our profits. So we get up to 900 million, then we'll stop and design another car. So 877, let's speed us up a little. Uh-oh. Uh, let it enforcement ban. Uh-oh, let's stop here. 904 million, about $6.43 billion of the month of February. So the governments of Hestevia and Frunia are expected to ban the sale of leaded fuel vehicles in about 10 years. So I guess the year of 1977 up here, or 60, 78? then it's illegal to manufacture leaded fuel vehicles because of them putting this enforcement in place. So anyways, let's build another car, seeing we're over $900 million in the bank. So new car project. Soon I wanted to build like a hatchback and a coupe in the last video, but I had to set up a family car because of marketing concerns. I might as well choose a city car, not an eco car, but a run-of-the-mill city car for now. Like have a hatchback model or a coupe model and go from there. I might as well try out this car, this 1965 XMB Coupe CPP with a 2.4 meter wheelbase. We'll use the coupe model and the hatchback model if needed. 
So the panel material, as per usual, seeing that we're limited in our factory, so steel panel material, and... Eventually to phase over to monocoque chassis, like maybe in the mid to late 70s, so ladder chassis again. Steel chassis material with a front launch usual type of engine placement. Sooner or later, I'll try out front transfers, but it'll make it front wheel drive. And choose a double wishbone front suspension and a semi trailing arm rear le uh, rear suspension because the game bitches about comfort the most, which is the most important factors when selling a car. And we're not going to be building another engine, so reuse the LJ16C, our 70 horsepower engine. It'll be rear drive with a manual 4 speed. Whoops, 4 speed. Sooner or later, we'll be in 5 speeds. With the top speed claiming 105 miles an hour. Ooh, I kind of like that. Maybe make this look like, like a fun car or something. I think we'll try out some radial tires with a hard long life tires, I believe. And what do they expect? Damn, 142s up front. The rear is 155, so let's do 155s front and back. And increase the tire diameter to 6... Yeah, 600s will do. And maybe rim size 15s? Yeah. The brakes, I guess, continue the use of drum brakes. Drum, a drum two shoe up front, I guess... 260s up front, and a drum single shoe, 250s in the back. No other tray, brake airflow, I guess a 12. The interior of this bad boy, it's a 2x2 two two setup because, well, it's a coupe. With a standard interior and a standard AM radio. Driver and safety aids, as per usual, let's try out a manual rack and pinion type steering with standard issue 1960 safety standards. And a suspension, uh, we'll try out some progressive springs, Gas mount two dampers past the sway bars, and we got some oversteering. This is pretty bad. Still got some oversteering. Well, I've cured the oversteering problem by putting some thicker rear tires and 25 miles per gallon. Not that bad. And it's a poor city car. Oh, it's a hatchback it wants. Well, let's go to a hatchback. Now, the city car is... I guess you should, I should mark this as a funker. 109%. Ooh, that's pretty nice. There's only two competing trims in this market and a city car, 17 of them. Affordability, 40% versus 35% affordability. And fun budget, 7%. That's terrible. So the demographic match for this car is at 68%, while we're at 51.6% for the fun car level. I guess we'll just pin this for now, and let's compare the difference. So, car is drivable, not that much in sportiness. Comfort is a total mid. City front point, all right. Uh, damn, what is this? A competitor gain. So, this is what they're at for my competition? A fun car. We need some sportiness. Maybe I'll probably make this like a fun car, like the... LJ16C engine would be like the base level, and the PC, maybe like a higher end tune model, the PC engine, that variant, would be like the more premier, sporty ish version of that car. Even the car is super drivable, but not the great and sportiest factor. And everything else seems average to above average, everything else. And even tune the brakes here to a better amount. It also changes with solid disc one piston for the front. So the fun factor almost 130% and city factor 61. And I also tuned the tires to a sport compound 155s front and back. It seems like I'll probably finalize this to a fun car, I guess. Make this a fun car and then the other car would be more uh, at a sportier level. Damn, changing this from a sports setting? <laughs> 166.8%. But we got some low comfort up in here. And even low off-road penalty. Bitch, they say an off-roader. What would you think this is? What if I change the rear suspension to a double wishbone? Where are we at? 185. And we are getting closer to the demographic match, almost matching up to a city car. But assuming the normalized desire would have been much higher, I'm guessing the demographic match would be like in the mid to upper 60s. So seeing that there's no need to adjust a vehicle like anything else in terms of the general attributes like the interior, exterior, wheels, brakes, and all that good stuff, I might as well design this car here as is in a time lapse. Well, let's adjust the rim offset real quick. Alright, so I got up to a 15 for the front and back, so now let's get ready to design this car in a time lapse, which will start right now. So for the design of this car, I struggled with the front end with the headlights for quite some time. First, I used some negative dog tape to cut into the body and make way for some vertical headlights. I tried using some vanilla and modded lighting fixtures, but most of them didn't fit that well. I ended up settling with some vertical brake lights that I've converted into headlights. I then added a large chrome grille to fill in the rest of the front fascia, along with these custom grille bars. 
By the time I added the bottom grill, my lights started flickering and I immediately saved my video, the commentary track, and my work before losing power for a little over an hour. After that, I got back to work to finish up the front end with the chrome bumper, turn indicators, the license plate, and so on. For the sides, it's quite basic. First, I changed up the rims to some modded ones where they show the BF Goodrich tire lettering. Then, I added a pair of side view mirrors towards the front fenders like the Wino Crane, a pair of side indicators on the front quarter panel, and even put this chrome strip below the doors on both sides, which took me some time to put that in place. Going towards the back, it was done very quickly and easily. First, I used a grill fixture and painted black to be used as some body molding for the taillights. Next, I placed the Weno word mark and the model name of the car called the Porus on the back of it. After that, I added the rear chrome bumper with the chrome guards, kind of like how I did the front bumper. For the taillights, there are two pairs of semi-elliptical lights. The ones on the far edge have the brake lights and the turn indicators, while the other one has also a brake light with a reverse light. To cap off the back, I slapped on a license plate in between the taillights and made some final changes to the exterior. Moving on to the interior, it wasn't that bad building one as we're a new decade and not relying on complicated interior fixtures. I mainly used a 1970s interior mod fixture pack for the seats and dashboard. Since the dashboard's gauges look kinda awkward due to lack of detail, I tried to change it up by using this old speedometer and several other gauges. This took me about 20 minutes to perfect as you see me trying to line everything up and fill in every nook and cranny so there's no obvious gaps in the dashboard. After I got all that done, I designed the floorboard. At first, I had a gray cloth color set up but ended up changing it to a darker shade of gray, which looked a bit better. I then added the rest of the essentials like the manual shifter, the steering wheel, pedals, rear mirror, and so on. Even with the wheel, I had to readjust the tachometer seeing that the wheel was blocking most of it. I made those adjustments which took me quite a while to do so and continued designing with the wheel by adding the Weno U logo on the center of the wheel. Then, I placed a couple pairs of door cards for the front and rear passengers. There were a lack of good door cards for this time period, which took me some time to choose which ones that I like. I then ended up choosing these ones with the cream and gray pattern for both of them. Next, I added the window crank, door handle, and armrest to wrap up with the interior. Finally, I repainted the car from the stereotypical automation red to this off-white color. So after getting everything done with this build, here's how it came out. This is the 1968 Weno Porus. This sporty hatchback may be small, but it still packs a punch. It's got a 1.6 liter, 4 cylinder engine, capable of producing 70 horsepower with a decent top speed and 0 to 60 time. Alrighty, so finally, I got the Wendell Porter's the standard edition model completely built up in here with the LJ Series LJ16C engine. And I know the car is not going to sell that well because of it being a fun car rather than being like a city car or a family car or whatever. I'm expecting sales to be quite a bit of a bit up in here, so despite going forth with this car, and probably building maybe an inline 6 model of this car, so despite these three problems, the front and rear difference being too hard, and the car's weight of a lack of power steering ability, let's sign off and see if a second higher trim model is feasible. So let's click on clone car trim and change the SE... I'm guessing SR again. But the problem is, with the LJ engine, is that when I make the inline 6 model, this will phase out the 4 cylinder model. What if I create a facelift? Make this a Mark III. So unfortunately, I can't do nothing with the PC engine, despite, uh, really? Despite going all through all that, a complete design, see if this works. No. Oh wait, active and deactivate? Oh, well, hold on. Are you sure to wish to activate LG16 PC for the facelift? Hold on. Cars that may, okay, here's the Weno Crane that'll cease its production. So, hold off. What about the PC? These guys, too. Well, how about first we check out the SR model? So, is an inline six? Okay, it seems okay. It can't be a front wheel drive car or a 4x4. But we got some usage with the engine bay. I don't really care about that. So, cast iron it is. And I guess single overhead uh, cam two valve like the LJ engine. 
So let's try a 2.6 liter engine, 80 millimeter bore, 86 stroke, which makes it to 2,594 cubic centimeters. And everything pretty much the usual for the rest of the engine, cam profile and all that stuff. Let's figure this out. So mechanical, well, not yet. All right, so I got the engine to a pretty healthy amount in terms of the power. So we got the power rating of 126.6 horsepower, 5100 RPM, and the torque at 140.8 pounds of torque at 3800 RPM. Not too bad of an inline six engine in the year of 1968 with it being a single red cam two valve. So let's give you a listen to what this engine sounds like right here. Well, it ain't no RB or 2JZ. It's not the greatest in sound, but it'll have to do for this time period. And adjust at the top speed, it claims a top speed of 120 miles per hour. Not that bad, and MPG mediocre. So I just changed this car up from a hatchback to a coupe. So before with the fun factor right here, it was at like 250% of the normalized desirability. But now this opens up to a whole new field of like being at the light sports level, track car, light budget, fun premium, a grand tour, okay. I think I'll consider this car as a light sports car for it being a coupe and doing pretty well. The demographic match normalizes desirability in only two competing trims and does pretty well with the stats here, like comparing the stats of like, the importance, my competitor, desirability, it seems like it's on par or exceeds it in pretty much every single factor that's declared important for this car. And seeing it's the more sportier level, I'll do a quick makeover of this car right now. Alright, so I changed the car from that little tannish white color on off way to a competition orange, kind of like the stereotypical muscle car scene was back in the 1960s for America. And I also changed up like the rims you see here to a more sportier setup, a front custom lip to add some front downforce, and even what's quite interesting for the first time I believe in my car builds is these loofers on the rear window. I never built any cars with a rear loofer on the rear of the windshield ever before because I kind of thought they would look a little bit more stupidish. And of course, being an SR, add the SR badge, and for the interior real briefly, I added some red accents to the side of the seats, the door cards, and the back seats. Everything for the rest of the interior has been unchanged. And a quick overview for the stats, we'll go over this real quick. So here's the drivetrain, the tires upgraded 175mm front and back, the brakes have been upgraded just a smidge and fine-tuned, and for the aerodynamics now, yep, it's been changed to about... Roughly 80 pounds of front and rear, like, lift after applying the front wing, like the front lip, and adding an invisible rear spoiler to basically add some rear arrow, quote-unquote, to the rear loofers. And here's the rest of the car, suspension, and all that good stuff in general. So, same thing like the SE model with the car having these types of problems. So, let's sign off with this model and see if we can go forth. Uh, oh yeah, I did change it to the light sport. So the car claims we're going to have this in 42 months of engineering time. Not too bad seeing that it used to be 46 months and now almost 43 because of our familiarity with most of these parts. So manualize this a smidge and make it a reliable and work hard, play hard. I guess 42 months will work. But here's the big problem with the LJ series engine in effect in this car and the last car to run a crane. What will happen if I configure the LW series engine? I renamed the inline six to LW. And 47 months. So 45 months will do. So put this to the Fronia tooling plan. So here's the LJ series engine and the LW. Do I have to make like a Mark III to forcefully carry over the LJ engine? Let's find out. If not, then it's inline six all the way for both models. So large factory. We'll probably do the upgrades in my next car build, so LW26. Uh, it's gonna sign off this engine. So if I had signed off, 45, so 1971, December 1971, this engine should be done. What if I go forward and forward until we get to the point where we see the car? So SC and SR. So the LJ series is just like through the roof because it doesn't even see the car about 10 million, it looks like. Yeah, the SR is going to do well. 
And the SC, not so much. The SR is going to do all the work. And look at the margin, $5,000 for the SE and the SR, fourteen dollars Looking at here, it seems like by year two, our stock exceeds the estimated factory shift point here. And the required shift, so we're going to have more in stock by year two, which realistically it'll probably have a cutoff around like five or six years every car build with this engine. Alright, drop the margin, 60% SE, 120 SR, so... December 1971 for both the car and engine, everything else in general. So the car and everything should be complete by the end of 1971. How about the sign-off part? LW. Uh, god damn it! I gotta go back and, like, how do I do this? Go to, like, the engine? I guess we'll take the risk and activate the facelift. Now it's 70.2 horsepower. Nice. Make it smidge better. Yeah, June 1968, but, uh, LJ concept. Huh? It's probably gonna force me to make another goddamn factory, I swear to god. This should work. Medium. Three. Build another factory, for crying out loud. Alright, put all the LJ engines over here. I guess the other factory would be for the inline six and the V engines, and so on. This will be the inline engine factory, the other will be the V engine factory, I guess. Yep, Mark Three. There we go. And let's change up the engine factory name. So, change engine factory two to Veggie tooling plant. Wow, my spelling there. Eh, not veggie. There we go. We vegan now. And for the heck of it, let's facelift both of these engines, both the PC and C level. We'll facelift them for the new engine factory. Oh, now this claims January 1971 for everybody? Oh, it's, oh, it's the factory building and the engine itself. This might be a huge risk trying to by building another factory and merging that engine, the LJ-16, to the new factory, by merging this engine to the new factory, causing a big hiccup in my car production and my profits too. So the LJ series is doing good, LW, a oh, hella good because of having only one car at this large factory doing all the work. So what if I sign off? 1971 also, and let's figure this out. Okay, Porus LW LJ Mark III, here we go. And let's take a risk, no loan. Let's sign off and see if this was a good idea all along. If I go bankrupt, I swear to God. Give me an excuse to go back to version 4.3. See, this is an LCV 4.2. The 4.2 version of this game that I'm uh, running on this campaign. Once I complete this campaign here for one of motor cars of v version 4.2, then I'll make the jump to 4.3 and then do all the sandbox editing and eventually, sooner or later, start a campaign series on that version of the game. So, making a healthy profit, let's just fast forward until something stupid happens. Damn, we're down on the 5 million. Okay, here's the comes, here comes the negatives. 2 million dollars losses, about a million to 2 million because it is now building, its factory is shutting down, but mainly it's the building the new factory. However, here we go, now we're making a profit, 4 million dollars. We're doing okay, and we're starting to see some pre-orders with the Porus. 32 million dollars, oh my god, an engine, what? 33 million dollars, damn, we're making hella buck. Uh, never mind. 27 million losses, 30 billion losses, everything's complete. Please clap. 30 billion dollars, almost 30. 14 million, let's wait until the end of 1972. Oh my god. The cars are okay. Uh, uh oh. Government of Gasmia has banned the sale of leaded fuel. Well, next engine, it'll be unleaded. So wait until it's 1973 and we'll stop here for the automation campaign. Look at $9 million. We're doing pretty well. Look at that. We're about to be at $10 million. Please get the 10 mark. 10.2 billion and stop. Exactly $10 billion there. And Hestevia is going to ban the sale of leaded vehicles. Enforcement begin in five years. Frunia, same thing. Enforcement begin in five years. So 1978, all leaded vehicles for most countries will be banned and we'll have to start investing and manufacturing unleaded fuel like today. So quick overview of the financial graph here. So car production, almost $290 million of expenditures, 271, 217 for the engine. So about 544 million revenue at 658.3 billion for the porous alone. And interest, about $21.4 million of loan interest. So in total for the year, I believe, we made $134 million. That is pretty nice. And the car is selling pretty well. 3800 units of this month alone last month for the se 1170 for the sr sport model and desirability 
I guess this was a mediocre car to begin with, but the fun car, the SE, is doing nice. Really nice. So anyways, let's bring these two cars over to BMG Drive to see how they drive if this car were to exist in real life. So here we are at the modded track of the American Road North Barstow State where this track here, this time trial, just so happens to be at the Top Gear test track, a one-to-one -one recreation of the famous Top Gear track. So it's only one single lap without a rolling start like they do in the show. So let's start off with the SE model of the Wendell Porus here in three, two, one, rev it, go. 4,000 RPM launch, bit of a mid. But hey, it makes about 70 horsepower. According to BBG, it makes 60 horsepower. Nice. And we could get a 0 to 62 test underway. 0 to 62, about 14 seconds. 13.92 seconds of 793.15 feet. Uh, it's pretty bit of a 70 ish horsepower engine car. This is my first time doing this on a freaking Top Gear track. Maybe first time alone being at the Top Gear track, let alone flat out doing a time trial with any vehicle in this layout. So under hard braking, there's no barriers. All right, seemed okay there. Didn't lock up the rear uh, and any of the tires there. Didn't lock up the brakes whatsoever, despite having two 60s up front and about the same with the drum brakes in the back. But I know the SR model has 270 millimeter front disc brakes, two piston disc brakes, and I believe they're also disc in the back, like a single piston in the back, being at like 250. And coming up to our final corner, hard brakes. Watch the apex shift at 1 minute, 52 seconds, 430 milliseconds. Well, at least I kept it to under 2 minutes. I'll give you that. So free roam. Please crash this car and load up the SR variant as the interior literally explodes. So let's load up the SR version of this car. So here is the SR version of this car, and what's kind of funny is that the engine sounds way quieter. I get a listen. Out of that smoke right in your face. So a time we have to be is, I believe, 1 minute 52 seconds, 430 milliseconds. So let's start things off here in 3, 2, 1, go. Mild amount of wheel spin. Fair enough. That's definitely a sports car. And 0 to 60, I swear. It's 8.13 seconds, 443.42 feet, so... What, is that 6 second difference between that and the SE model? And the brakes really lock up compared to this model versus the SE. And we're understeering. Let me fix that real quick. Alright, got that taken care of. How about this sweeping right-hander? At... Hammerhead? Is that, the, is that the corner name? It's been a while since I've seen a freaking Top Gear episode and seen, like, hot laps around this track. I believe this is Hammerhead with the chicane, so how about a braking here? No immediate lockup, but we get a lockup at slower speeds, it seems like. And final corner, good entry, and 1 minute 41 seconds, 849 milliseconds, so a 12, no, like 10 and a half second difference between the SR bottle and the SC. So what would this time compare on the Top Gear test track, like the actual wiki times? So let's say a 141A, it appears it's a tad worse compared to the Ford Mondeo and a bit better than the Bentley Mulsane Speed under very wet conditions, which is pretty much on the bottom, very bottom tier of this list here. And the SE model, which is a bit worse, a 152, worse than a Bentley Meteor with a Spitfire engine in a car, and way better than the Ford Transit World Rally. So but hey Mr. Tree, can you please nuke my car into a billion pieces after I crash at high speed? I think it says you're welcome. So anyways, for the final part of the video, let's bring these two cars down a big-ass cliff face at good old Leap of Death to see how these two cars can hold up. If I can find the map here, and here we go. Let's bring you to the top of the ramp. Oh, map right now. So here we're at the top of the ramp, starting with the SE, accelerate this bad boy at a very slow speed with a freaking stargazing ass, Travis Scott type of ceiling that we got going here, the sky, and the speed, 45 mile an hour exit speed, alright, I'm guessing the SR would be like right around 60 or maybe a little bit more, and the speed we're gonna hit is just shy of 200 miles an hour air speed, and what's it like crashing at this, a little bit too fast at this speed, there goes all the interior fixtures, some of the chassis that was poking out and exploding all over the place, the bumpers, and the 
trim to the front grill? Uh, I guess so. So what's it like? Engine is dead, so full time all the way. If the engine would have been still running, are we gonna get wedged? No, but we almost did. I want to say the engine would have been still running, then I don't know what to say. That's pretty much the power of automation to beam and G converted vehicles. If it would have been a beam and G vehicle, then like that first hit, even at a much, much slower speed, like front end impact like that, then the engine would have already been dead. So we're getting very close to the bottom here. And we could get stuck at this spot, I swear to God. We're stuck, and we're just shy of the lake. So yeet this bad boy. There we go. Now we're good, right? Please splash. Nope. And... Splash goes the SC model. Now let's do the SR model. Alright, Mr. SR, do your thing. Hit the accelerator, and drop down, and let's see if we can get a better like, exit speed compared to the SE. There goes my front lip. 53 miles an hour. 8 miles an hour better, but it'll do. Oh boy, this is gonna be a deadly-ass collision. 204 mile an hour? Let's see. Into this little spire-looking part of the terrain, and could we get stuck right here? Almost got stuck. Are you kidding me? There goes a rain of debris all over the place, all over the map. And let's see if we can get down, like, all the way down without getting stuck like earlier. I was about to say, if I would've got stuck back there at that first impact with this car, then... <laughs> that would have been way too, like, bizarre for me to explain, like, how the hell that happened. Because I never got stuck on this map here before, like, on my first impact. So we splashed there, as so this car, so it's recovered to two cars and some flat land. So here's the SR model, and we got this car looking it's been straight out of a freaking scrapyard facility with the tire still intact. I swear, can I eat this off without... It's probably gonna happen. I'm probably gonna eat the car with the tire with it. Yeah, let's not mess with this any further. As we'd see with the rest of the car, we got the engine doing the jitsu stuff. I mean, as it always does with the engine semi-detached with the beams and everything of the vehicle. Now, comparing this to the SR, still a scrap of best with the inline 4 engine. Looks like it's been, like, almost freaking turned to, like, a best of, like, PS1 game or whatever. We got sharp polygons everywhere. Might be the drive shaft, I don't know, or the transmission. But whatever, this is a pile of best, bunch of sharp polygons that could kill you at any time of night or day or whatever, wherever you go. The brakes are exposed, the engine's exposed, and everything about the car, like the SR, is a pile of scrap metal. So, with the Wenoporus, my first hatchback, and pretty much decent sports car per se, especially the SR model. Well, I did manage to figure out the problem with the Weno Crane, recovering all my losses from the past couple months, like several months with that ordeal in the last video. At least, I recouped those losses, thanks to you guys in the comments of the last video helping me guide on what really was the problem. And especially to me, with the success of the poorest, skating like over 10 million dollars, 20 million dollars a month for having a good four cylinder engine and a high performance inline six cylinder engine. But anyways, this car is a dependable hatchback for the SE model and a good performance coupe model if you got the SR version with the six cylinder engine. So anyways, that'll do it with Automation's light campaign version 4.2 and Beam and G Drive. And for those who are interested in this type of content, please be sure to like and subscribe so you won't miss out on any videos like this in the future. So this is Tries Rising Up, and signing out.